Welcome to Food Psych, a podcast about intuitive eating, body positivity, and health at every size. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and I'm a registered dietitian, nutritionist, and certified intuitive eating counselor specializing in weight-inclusive wellness. Join me as I talk with interesting people from all walks of life about their relationships with food. Uh-huh. I, I remember I was teething, little gums bleeding, Friday evening, it was all about eating. When I became a teen, it was all about beef, and now I'm ready for the world. Try and sink my teeth in, stacking it. Hey there, welcome to episode 101 of Food Psych. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and today I'm talking with Rachel Estapa, a yoga teacher, life coach, and speaker who helps people make peace with their bodies and accept their size. She is such a great guest. We had a really amazing, far-ranging conversation about recovering from diet culture, body shaming in childhood, how she finally ended her fight against her body, and why she launched a blog called More to Love that has really taken off and morphed into an amazing amazing business. So I can't wait to share it all with you in just a moment. And I would love to hear your feedback in our Food Psych Listener Facebook group. We have such an amazing group now with thousands of people from around the world, fellow listeners like you, sharing your reactions to the podcast and also sharing resources and support on this anti-diet journey. So it's become a really lovely, supportive community, and I would love for you to be a part of it. To join, just go to christyharrison.com slash community, and you'll be redirected to the Facebook page where you can submit a request to join. We manually approve everyone so that we can help it stay a safe space of people who are really committed to the anti-diet journey and not a place that's full of trolls or spammers. So head over to christyharrison.com slash community, click on the request to join the group, and then you can come join us and be a part of this great community of fellow anti-diet warriors. Before we get into today's episode, I just want to share a great resource for helping you make peace with food, which is my free audio guide, Seven Simple Strategies for Making Peace with Food and Your Body. And you can find it at christyharrison.com slash strategies, or you can text the number 44222 with the word food psych. So that's the phone number 44222, and then text the word food psych to that number, all one word, food psych, and you'll get your free audio guide with my seven simple strategies. It's basically like a quick start guide to intuitive eating and size acceptance. And it's infused with all the principles of non-diet and health at every size that we always talk about on this podcast. But I get a lot of people asking me, like, how do I get started? Like all this anti-diet stuff is awesome. I'm so on board, but how do I actually start practicing it. So this audio guide is my kind of quick solution to that. So head over to christyharrison.com slash strategies to get it. If you like the podcast and you want to help us reach more people who need to hear the body positive message, give us a nice rating and review on iTunes or better yet, share with friends and family or share on Twitter and Facebook. Because when you share podcasts via iTunes, that also helps bring us up in the ranking and helps more people find us. Because actually, who needs to hear the body positive message is probably someone who's scrolling through the health podcast on iTunes, right? That person is probably pretty vulnerable to diet culture messages, and some of the other podcasts in there are really diety. So if someone stumbles into one of the clean eating podcasts or the paleo podcasts or the keto podcasts, God help them, right? But if they stumble upon us and get the body positive message and the health at every size message at this vulnerable point, maybe we will have saved someone from years of pain or at least helped intervene to jumpstart their recovery from diet culture at a point where it could have gone really the opposite direction. So help us do that. Help us reach more people by sharing episodes on iTunes. The way you can do that is in your phone. If you're looking at the podcast app, that little purple app in your phone, click on the three dots at the bottom of the episode page. So if you're in, like if you're listening to this episode, there should be three dots at the bottom of the screen on the right-hand side, click that. And then at the bottom of the menu there, it'll say share episode. And you can click that to share on Twitter, notes, mail, or just copy the link and do whatever you like with it. And if you're on your computer, there's a little drop down menu on the right-hand side and it should say share on Twitter, share on Facebook or copy link. So you can share it that way. It really helps us out and it helps other people out too because they can discover this whole world of health at every size and body positivity at the moment when they need it most. All right. So without any further ado, let's go talk to Rachel Estapa. So tell me about your relationship with food growing up. 
That is really the genesis of so much of why I do the work that I do now. And I would be unable to kind of talk about body acceptance today without dipping into the past. So I actually like that there's this idea of, of where you come from and how food plays into this. So I actually grew up in a Italian Irish household and there was a lot of food around for holidays, just everything. And my mother, particularly such a gifted cook and baker and every holiday, there was this like an emphasis on the food being an Italian family predominantly with the holidays. That was sort of like the star of the show. But from an early age, also, I, I had learned that my body size was something people were starting to comment on. And so here, here I was, you know, a life of food and like food is love, food is family. But yet some people, some members of my family, mostly, you know, if I went to the doctors or just like other people, other kids in the neighborhood and in school, there were these comments around my body size. So it wasn't, it didn't take too long to put the two together, right? That somehow people were associating what I was eating with how I was looking in the world and my, and what my body type looked like. But I remember things like uh, as a kid, you know, I always just got excited around food. I personally love to cook anyway. So it really was a bit of a confusing relationship when I was younger to balance something that you genuinely love and that you see people around you loving, but there's a lot of comments and assumptions and just messages from inside the family, from outside the family that there's something maybe disconnecting with a love of food and how that relates to my body and how people perceive my body. Does that answer your question? Oh, yeah. So that it's like you were made to feel shame about your love of food, it sounds like. Yeah. And one of the earliest memories that I have around body shame, you know, as a kid, you don't know but these things. These are adult constructs that are, you know, put onto children. And I'll never forget this, that it was around, I want to say I was like six or seven and I was at a pool party down the street with some friends. And I've always kind of been like a bit of a, a go-getter and just really not unabashed with a lot of things. So I remember getting up on a picnic table and it was in my bathing suit. I just come out of the of the pool and I started to just like, you know, prance around on the on the picnic table. And the mother of one of the the mother of one of the of the kids at the at the thing too poked my stomach and said, Looks like somebody's had a lot of ice cream this summer. Oh. And I remember I didn't know what that meant, but I meant I knew that it was like I felt really bad and I actually that was one of the moments where I started to turn inward. Like I held myself back because there was this comment about she touched my belly and poked at it and made this comment about associating it with too much ice cream, which she had no idea, you know, that even yeah. here there if that was true or not. No. But that's really one that it's those little things that, that were are a passing comment to someone that become the framework of how you view so much about your body and how much you're allowed to show the world what you enjoy. And for a long time, like I felt like I wasn't able to get excited about food or get excited about things because it would just come back to, well, you're too big for your size, or you shouldn't be eating that. Or you, you as kids, we want to avoid feeling uncomfortable, even though we don't know why necessarily. And then there was a string of, of things like that, like it's this little offhand. I, I remember more the offhanded comments that people may have said in passing than I do like deliberate comments or, or maybe taunts that kids make. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's somehow like the offhanded comments seem more real or something. People don't recognize how much an offhanded comment can stick with someone. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it kind of catches you off guard. And, and then as a coach, I'm a trained coach and, um, you know, someone that spends so much time in the body acceptance realm, you know, those are the genesis of what we get our negative inner voice from. And it's these little seeds that are planted, just us going about life and trying to figure out how to even just navigate things. And, and it wasn't until I was in my, you know, early 20s that I was able to sort of dive back into those threads, those seeds of the past, and understand that the voice that I had assumed for so long was my own judgment, my own perceptions, or my own understanding about food, body image connection, also being, you know, too much in the world. Like I was telling, I was, you know, prancing around on the picnic table as happy as can be. And my instinct was to then hide myself and to lessen myself and to diminish myself. Those little comments, they, they become your own voice. And it isn't until you can, can start to separate that. Can, does healing come? Does a power come? Does strength come? And that's really something that I personally 
helps people understand and, and make those connections that you can't change your past, but you can change your relationship to the past. Absolutely. And things that, you know, happened before we are allowed to redefine and change that relationship to the story. Yeah. Cause how different would it have been if you had been able to say to that woman, like, get your hands off my belly. What are you doing? You know, policing my size. Exactly. And what, what eight year old or seven year old would do that? <laughs> I know. I mean, that's a pretty advanced move for a seven year old, but it's like, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, to have that energy now. Yeah. Even now it's hard. Right. Even now it's hard. Even now it's challenging to serve. Sometimes you're like, I don't have the energy to feel like I have to justify my body or justify myself against people's assumptions. And you know, there's a lot of folks that sort of talk about this in the body positive world, you know, where's the line between educating people and taking on their stuff and preserving your own integrity and preserving your own boundaries is a delicate line. It really is. Yeah. Cause we really want to change people. We want to, I think like there's a sort of zealous zealousness or zeal when, you know, people first come to this movement and have their eyes opened around diet culture mm-hmm. and all the ways that it's hurting people. Of course you want to go out and tell everybody and be like, no, don't do that. It's hurting you. But people aren't ready to hear that. Like think about what it took for you to get there. You know, anyone who's, who's in that place right now, it's like that took you years to recognize and come to the place where you're able to hear it and sort of take it in. So everybody has their journey with it. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. And I can identify with that a lot. And then a lot of the arc that I, I teach body acceptance and I teach the approach of more to love really does come from that sense of a spark that there's another way possible, but then the, I have no idea what that way looks like. So there's the excitement of something fresh and new kind of detaching from old myths and detaching from a diet perspective and sort of diminishing your body and and either physically or mentally or spiritually, whatever, whatever you're doing. But there's a a sense of, well, how do I actually listen and understand myself? Because I've been operating in a way that follow this, do that. This person's obviously wiser than me. They know what they're doing. Even that in and of itself is learning to trust yourself is a process. And and for me, all those components, while they may look separate on the, on the surface, I mean, they're so intimately entwined. Like how, how one eats, how one is with their body in movement, how one is with their, their own self and their own thoughts, how they are in relationships, how they are out in the world in the bigger sense. To me, those are so intimately interwoven that it's almost impossible to to look at one aspect of your life without them having the ripple effects and what comes up from that in another area of life. So then you have to really make sure that you're I mean, not, maybe not anticipating that, but like preparing yourself because it's all often the unexpected source causes an unexpected ripple effect somewhere else in your life. That's such a great point. That's something that I talk about on the podcast a lot and that other guests have shared too. Like when you first start maybe trying to recover from diet culture, for example, and learn to eat intuitively, you know, I'm an intuitive eating coach. So that's like my way in with people. But of course, they start to see like that intuition with regard to food often translates to intuition with regard to relationships or work or other self-care practices. Like there's never a way to just look at one area of life and not have it translate. And people often will recognize like, oh, wow, I'm so disconnected from my hunger cues and taking care of my needs in that way with food. And I'm also so disconnected from my self-care needs with regard to sleep or getting up out of my desk at some point during the day and not overworking or whatever it is, like people will just start to kind of put all these things together and see patterns in their lives, which can feel sort of overwhelming, I think, if you're not ready for that. So, and even if you are ready Mm -hmm. for that, if you've heard people talk about it, it's like, yeah, 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 cool, I'm ready. But (laughs) when it starts to really look you in the face, it's a different story. Absolutely. And so much of, of this, that's my own story. I went through my young years, all of my teen early teen, adolescent years, high school, college, perpetually on some type of diet, either, you know, whatever the hot one was, but more often than not, it was this sense of God. I used to, I used to pray (laughs) before bed, please let me wake up with a different body. And that was so painful to look back on it. And, And now that I'm sharing all this more with my family, they sort of feel like, Oh my God, like, they feel bad that they that they somehow they missed it or messed up. And it's like, I had a beautiful childhood. 
I had so many wonderful things that, that I love, but it was always laden with the sense of Rachel's wonderful. Rachel's a great student. Rachel's creative, blah, 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 blah. But she has the weight problem. And it was the weight problem that was such a filter for so much of myself all through really up until my early twenties, to be honest. But the thing is, is that what I also know to be true is there is such beautiful relief, relief, healing, openness. Like I feel that I'm truly myself when I don't avoid those struggles or avoid those issues or, or topics or realities for me. I actually now derive a lot of strength from them. And that sort of is like a level that I've worked hard to get there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Sort of around the block in a way. I, I sort of dipped into the self-love, not necessarily from the body. From from the first part, I, I kind of went a little deeper and then it eventually radiated out to the body for me. So I really try to, at least when I teach people in a yoga class or, or when I'm, you know, giving a lecture or just any kind of thing where there's people trying to mend that relationship with themselves, that the more that you can face that, those pains, those struggles, um, again, to your own you know, level and in your own comfort, like you don't have to head straight on into things, but there is a, there is a magic to it. There is a, and almost like a coming home, but from the different, from the different door <laughs> in a way. And it, it, it's what makes me feel, it's what makes me feel so happy that I have that trait in me to want to, to look at myself in that way. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. When did it, it all start for you sort of going back into your story? Like that, first comment that you remember, was that the start of the dieting or did it come on later? Yeah. I went to my first nutritionist at age 10 and actually there's a story kind of associated with it. So it was summertime and I actually grew up just north of Boston in a community that's by the ocean. And, you know, like every single day I had just like endless beach and endless Mm -hmm. things to play on. So it was just like, you know, picture perfect. When people think of New England and like beachy, like that's what I grew up in. Now, I loved it, but one summer particularly, I rollerbladed for straight up and down this coast because I wanted to lose as much weight as possible so that I didn't have to hear my doctor say, you're too big, again, at my next annual check-in. And I like rollerbladed my heart out. And of course, I heard it, you know, from, I'm, you know, you're too big for your, for your age. And that's when I started seeing a nutritionist. And it was so embarrassing. And it couldn't have been more like complete opposites where here I am, this young woman, 10, 11, that, that age, whatever that is starting to go like, start like this might even have been before I have the talk. Right. So here I am. I don't even know what's ahead of me for, for biological womanhood or female anatomy, but here I am already feeling like whatever's going on for me now, it's, it's not right. It's something's wrong. But the nutritionist was a much, 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 much older man. Very, very, very slender and totally checked out. Like, and I just remember sitting there being like, how does this person, how does he know what it's like for me? And I always felt like I had to then defend and justify and like explain, like, I'm not this person that is going around stuffing her face with whatever, whatever, whatever. But that's what I believed was what they must think. So I would be afraid to write down anything in my food journal. I'd be afraid to write down water. I would be afraid to write down crackers. But then I have to say, after maybe like a couple weeks of that, it was my dad who who was driving me to the appointment, um, and my dad, my, my me, and my dad are, are very close. We were we were growing up, and I just remember him saying, "He's like, don't worry about all this stuff, Rach." And I think he understood like that this is not I'm not happy doing this, and that I'm uh, that and for all intents and purposes, I'm a I'm a happy, healthy, fun loving kid, just in a bigger body than people think that I ought to be for whatever measurements they're going against. But it's still, I mean, it really, it stings. Like even talking about it now, I think, God, what would I, what would I say to her, the little Rachel back then? And that's, that's really where the, where the past and the history, you have to have, you have to have a relationship, a loving relationship with yourself in order to like, when those thoughts and, and insecurities come up to be able to recognize that and then hold it because there's really nothing more. <laughs> we can't go back and re and redo it. Mm-mm. But again, so I, like I said, I went through dieting through middle school, high school. I did a really big concerted effort in college. 
<laughs> when I went to college. And a lot of that was stemmed from the attire. You know, I was so sick and tired of, of not feeling like I could like wear things. And I think about that now, like if I had today's access to, I consider myself, you know, I'm plus size. I have no problem saying that. I, I use the term fat. I use the term chubby. I use, you know, I don't, I bigger bodied. But those are words to me that are true of my body size. But if I had that access to what things are available today, clothing wise back then, that also I think would have helped. But I lost uh, about pounds in a year in my, between my sophomore and junior years of, of high school, of college. And that's really when I exercised a lot. I was always active. I played soccer. I was always a very, very active kid. But this was sort of like I was going to the gym days a week for hours at a time. It was bordering on obsessive. Mm. Yeah, it was like instrumental exercise. Exactly. And then it got harder to maintain that. Like it was the biggest fear of mine was like, I can't keep this up. Like, <laughs> you know, and, that, and that sort of goes around a lot of a lot of diets that, you know, you get the results up front, right? It's it's sort of like, oh my, you get your return on the investment if you follow it to pie the T. But the collateral damage, the emotional, the physical exhaustion, the, the money to, you know, follow whatever you may be following and all that stuff, it was it was quickly becoming unsustainable. And it wasn't actually resolving any of the the pieces that were stemming my insecurity or my lack of confidence in body image and all those things. It wasn't touching it. It was actually sometimes in some instances it was making it worse because now people were telling me, Oh, you look so good. Now they tell me that, Oh, you look so pretty. And again, you get confused around that. Yeah. Those compliments can be so dangerous. Yeah. And you know, I do know that they, I mean, people, and I, and I don't think people are malicious. It doesn't come from a bad place. Like I understand that we're conditioned in our culture to praise that we're conditioned to say that, you know, there's value in people augmenting their larger bodies. And so like, you know, given this, given the time, given the space, like I was like, yeah, awesome. You know, I did fix what was wrong with me. It totally played into what I thought, but a year or so later, it was just not something that I could keep up. And then I was, so I, I stopped the feverish, <laughs> the feverish working out. I stopped the restrictive food consumption. And then I had a series of health issues come up. And I don't know if, if it was sort of, I don't know which came first, like if that sort of triggered a bunch of stuff or blah, 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 blah. But in that window of right after losing a ton of weight and it's starting to come back, I had a multitude of serious health issues, you know, things that put me in the hospital. Some were based on anxiety. Some were based on this notion of why is it that no matter what I do, I'm not unlovable. And that is so core to like my identity with, with health, with, with body image, that this sense of like, I got to make up for my flaw. And that finally came to a head in my life. I was diagnosed with a tumor in my ovaries, so that had to be removed. And then I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS. So it also sort of, it connected a lot of dots as to why had weight always been a, you know, my thing. It connected a lot of that. But then it also made me realize like, whoa, there is a lot of stuff that I've got to pause and review. Like, where is the sense of, of love coming from? Why is it that I feel this way? Like, what's that about? And that's really what, to me, that's when Mortal Love started. It wasn't a business that does X, Y, Z. It really began in that period of my life when I was literally lying in a hospital bed, completely disassociated from my body, like had no idea that I couldn't even feel this tumor that was like turning my ovary. Like I just so out of sync with, with feeling myself coupled with anxiety, coupled with all this stuff. It was just like, and that's to me when I, I felt like I finally kind of became the Rachel that I always wanted to be. Mm. When you were at your most vulnerable. Exactly. Those defenses were sort of stripped away. They were, they were stripped away. And it was just sort of that, like there, there was nowhere else to go. There was no more hiding behind sarcasm. There was no more hiding behind baggy clothing. There was no more hiding behind not speaking up if I didn't like something. There's also diminishing myself from not being, you know, the center of attention or, or sharing my gifts. You know, I, I felt like that was really that, that pivotal moment of how are you going to handle this, Rachel? Are you going to shrink or are you going to embrace it and say, I may not know what I'm doing or where I'm going, but I'm going to try to make this better for myself. And I think about that 
and how much my life changed. I mean, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating how much my life changed when I committed to learning what love meant. And not in the romantic sense, because relationships were a whole other thing completely tied with my sense of, of self-identity and worth. There were no boyfriends to speak of. There were there was nothing. No one ever asked me out. But like this aspect of, of love beyond what we think it means, like the, this perspective, this view of life, this view of, of taking care of yourself, but also honoring what's scary, like it, it opened the whole universe to me. And I felt so, I felt free but clueless at the same time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I was just daunted. And and even how I even how I looked at food changed. Where, you know, in the past I would I and I noticed one of the things that I would eat in anticipation of fearing that I'd be hungry later on. That I was afraid of being without. I was afraid of that emptiness that sense of like a hollow belly feeling. So I would safeguard myself to not ever allow that to happen. And I'll admit it, I still have, I still struggle with that. And there's the, that aspect of the hunger of physical, is the hunger of soul and the emotions. But that's really when I started to examine that. And that's when I started to notice that there were certain, even certain foods that I would be eating for a way absentmindedly and how I was just really curious as to what did I really like around food? What did I really like around movement? What did I really like around how I talk with people or how I, the, the line of vulnerability, the line of, of courage, the line of sharing myself, like it was all a little experiment to see what's my default and what is the thing that I can sort of lead and push through with. And that's a question we don't really ask ourselves, right? In diet culture. I mean, with food, I can't tell you how many clients of mine and I had this experience too in my own recovery where it was like, wait, what do I like? What do I want? Why is that even, re- you know, like this sort of sense of like, mm-hmm. that's not even relevant. It's it's whether it's healthy, whether, you know, like, is it going to kill me or not? Like that was the only lens in which I saw food. And a lot of people I work with like had been seeing food up until a certain point and to sort of open up the horizon and say like, no, actually, what do you like? And what do you want? Like, what is your experience of eating this food? Is it satisfying? Does it make you happy? Like, like those are questions we just do not ask ourselves in diet culture. And same with, you know, in this misogynist patriarchy that we live in, women and people socialized as women, you know, don't ask ourselves or don't get a lot of opportunities to ask ourselves what we really want, how we really feel when we're talking to someone, what a certain relationship means to us or, you know, whether we want to get out of it or whatever. It's kind of like, no, just please everybody and always think about how you're coming across to others. Don't think about how you actually feel when you're with those others and whether or not you want them in your life. So I can see how all of those questions, like asking yourself those questions is just a radical act. It really was. And you have to be prepared to answer them, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to be prepared to answer them and then realize oh my gosh, how my life has been designed or architected (laughs) isn't complementing these like more core emotions. So I had to do some cleanup. I had to do some emotional cleanup, mental cleanup, personnel cleanup in my life. (laughs) You know, I had to, I physically moved, um, you know, not very far, but I moved to a new, a new area of of a place I always wanted to move to, but I was like, I can't, you know, you give all the, I can't do this. I can't do that. And then there's sort of this, Ripple effect, there's a snowball effect of confidence. And I talk about this a lot in my work with More to Love that you know, a lot of people believe that change is a is a lack of, of will, right? And that change comes as simple as a light switch. You just haven't figured out how to keep that light switch on and off or found the right light switch. But I talk about like the snowball effect of confidence, that there are these little tiny nuances and specks of opportunities throughout the day, probably the stuff that you're taking for granted right here, right now, that when you shift or maybe try something a little bit differently, how that then um, excites you and gets you motivated for the next thing. So a lot of times, you know, especially, especially with diet, the diets work this way, right? Like you kind of, you jump head first into it. You, you clean your cabinets, you clean your fridges, you get all the books, you buy the programs. It's just like this huge endeavor and you jump in and then you get overwhelmed. And so it sort of sets people up 
for for misery, for frustration, for and then turning back on themselves and saying like, gosh, there's something wrong with me. If, if I have all of this laid out in front of me, what is wrong with me, right? I take almost the complete opposite approach. <laughs> it's like, well, forget all that stuff. It's like, what in this moment, what are you feeling? Do you even know what you're feeling? And what aren't you feeling? And I, and ex, I'm a yoga teacher also. And it comes down to things that people are so probably so think it's so mundane and boring with so like your breath, the awareness of your body, the, your feet on the ground, your, the space around you. It is just like going really small from within and then expanding without. And then if you can do that with your physical body, right, then it can go to, well, where's my concentration going? Where are my habits going? Where's my energy going? Where's my time, my money, my resources, my, like, it just keeps going and going instantly. But unless you start experiencing that really on the level of the self and, and knowing that it's meant to be messy and meant to be trial and error and meant to be uncomfortable, then all the other bigger things is just a replication of how you are with the smallest thing. Like I truly believe that how you do one thing is how you do everything. So focus on the one thing first and then just let that answer, let that truth, let that process lead the way. And I mean, I, that, that's, how, that's what works for me. <laughs> that's a beautiful way of putting it. And I, I really resonate with that in my own life because I definitely had such tightness around everything, you know, like I was so uptight. I was so controlled. I was definitely have a very type A tendency, but then I was like yearning for freedom and I wanted to move away and see a different part of the country. I wanted to open up my relationship with food and not have all these things be off limits. And P.S., the ones that were off limits were always the ones I binged on too. So that was like my body's Mm -hmm. way of finding freedom for me, even though I fought against it. You know, like I wanted to not have to exercise in certain ways, even like the concept of exercise, it was punishing. It was not like joyful movement. It was doing it for an instrumental purpose, you know, and like, I remember the first time I took a yoga class, I was in college and I was very much in the midst of my eating disorder. I don't even know why I stumbled into this yoga studio and took this class, but like afterwards, I literally felt high. I came out of there, Mm -hmm. I was like kind of dizzy and stumbling and I was like, whoa, that was amazing. What just happened? And I think it scared me. I think it was sort of too much for me to like keep going back regularly. I sort of forgot about it. I just like, you know, didn't make time in my schedule or, oh, the classes don't work out or whatever. But it wasn't until like years later that I rediscovered yoga and sort of got a taste again of what that was, which was like presence and letting go of the thinking mind and the controlling and being more in my body. Like that was just something that had never happened for me. And as soon as I really went into it and really started practicing yoga in earnest was when all of the other aspects of my life kind of started to fall into place because of what I was learning there, like because of thinking about presence and being more intentional and in the moment and letting things be and just noticing them as they are and trying to accept them and like breathe through it. You know, that was like, Mind blowing at the time. And now Mm -hmm. that's a concept that I can more easily integrate into other areas of my life. But, you know, of course, it's still a dance, right? Like now I am fine with eating, recovered from that issue, but now work can sometimes totally consume me. So it's just, I think it's been. Yeah, like a process of learning how to how to dance with that tendency that is natural for me and bring in some more you know, awareness and openness to my everyday life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And as you were sharing that, the thing about yoga, at least for me, it's, it's the reason why I loved it wasn't because I thought it was going to change my body at all, but well, that's why I went to it originally. (laughs) That's not why I ended up sticking with it because in a class, in the middle of all throughout the class, I noticed that I'm not thinking, I'm just noticing and I'm being present in my body. And that was so miraculous for me because even in that process of just observing and noticing and responding and adjusting and honoring, there was no level of judgment. And I take that 
my experience, you know, have tested it with other people, predominantly women that are that are considered larger or have are bodies that they have either been trying to change their whole life or, or whatever, whatever have mm-hmm. you, and help them have this visceral experience of their own body in a way that doesn't demand any outcome from it. And that's what's so powerful. And that's what I know that the mortal lovelies, that's what we're called, enjoy the most. That there's this ability to step onto a mat, have an hour, where the only thing you have to do is just feel what you feel. And I really take a lot of time to guide people around that. Again, being in your body, if you if you spent your whole life trying to run away from it, it can be very uncomfortable. And I know that I have lived that and I have heard that. So my whole uh, approach to, especially with teaching yoga to people that have had these labored relationships with their body, it's not telling them what they should feel. It's inviting them to notice what's already there. And that little shift carries with them off the mat. And I always say, it's like, you know, this mat is an experiment for your life. Like, what you do here, it's like you can do that, that same consideration for other things in your life that maybe don't have anything to do with yoga or your body. But that tendency, that this is the space to be able to practice. This is the space. That's why it's called practice, right? This is the space to be able to let go, but at the same time, somehow be held. I don't know how it, how it happens, <laughs> but there's this beautiful part about being in the body where in a way that's not goal oriented, right? To let go, but somehow be held at the same time. And that's the paradox. That is bliss. That is what makes makes it all just gel and to have that space in your life. And whatever people, maybe for some it's yoga, maybe for some it's writing, walk, whatever it is, to be able to find that and to not become, you know, it's really hard to not become like obsessed about it, something that like works. You know what I mean? Because there is this fleeting, there's this fleetingness to it. There's this transcendentalness to things like that. And that's really hard. That's, that's also, I can see that diet culture, right? That there's an end point and your goal is to get to that point And then it's a magic, whatever number, size, whatever have you, how you're going to feel, everything's going to be amazing when you get to this point. <laughs> and I sometimes when they bum people out, but I'm like, there's no there, there. There's this is a process. This is sometimes the body that you, you know, feel and wake up with is not gonna be the one that you went to bed with. Like that clinging to something static. And even with food, especially with me, like even this week, you know, yesterday for for whatever reason, I was just like munching. Like I didn't want a meal at all. But I was just like, I want, I want a little bit of this. I want a little bit of that. And I want a little bit of this. I think if it was me a few years ago, I would have like panicked and I would have associated that with, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be, you know, tracking all of that and counting all of that, blah, 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 blah. But last night, and I even told my husband that, I was like, I'm in a munchy mood. And, you know, I just like owned it. And I was like, this, this might be good. This might be good. And then, you know, I just went on, what, I went on with my life. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and like, it's embracing that like fleeting moment, right? There's nothing in my life that food wise that I don't say I can't have. There's things that I know that I don't enjoy. Like, I don't like tomatoes. I just have tried. <laughs> <laughs> they just don't like me for whatever reason. And I was like, you know what? People say, oh, you should eat all that stuff. It's like, you know what? They don't do it for me. They they don't do it for me. But, you know, broccoli and asparagus, oh, my God, my favorite. Chocolate-covered pretzels, oh, my God, my favorite. Like, food to me now is just something to – I trust myself more with it. I trust myself more with my body. I trust myself more with my decisions that it's not going to make or break me. Is it perfect every day? No, absolutely not. I'd be worried if it was. You know, I'm worried about right, people exactly. whose food is like looking perfect, quote unquote, because that means too much control is happening. Yeah. And I, this is kind of kind of weird, but I put um on my Facebook post today, I wrote, I was like, I have new life advice for everybody. Um, and I was like, just learn how to roast a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Learn how to learn how to roast a chicken, and then I kind of went on to say, like, it doesn't matter what it is, right? Like, just learn to make and create something that, no matter how crazy or how messed up or just you know discouraged or, or bummed out you get with the world, you can always come and point to something that you're like, I created this, 
And I was like, this is what a hobby is. This is, you know, for me, I love, I love, food. I love cooking. I, I own it, you know, and it's fun for me to be able to do that. And the sense is like, whenever we're trying to control our natural urges, that's really when I feel that we're suppressing the, the spark that makes us connect with who we are and dieting culture can completely, it, it means it is that it's, the bridling of, of a natural process. And I'll be honest, I don't, I'm not a food and intuitive eating teacher or expert. I kind of, you know, dipped into it. I realized I'm not my, not my passion. So I kind of went another way, but I'm also very personal with it. You know, it's, it's intimate. It, it's private. It's, it's something that I'm like, I don't really don't care if what other people think about what I like to eat or what I'm eating or what I'm not eating. Yeah. It's not a competition to me. So that's such a powerful sort of impulse in this day and age, like the desire to keep your eating private because it is, it's so intimate. It's like literally Mm -hmm. putting something from outside into your body. It's one of the most intimate acts, you know, and yeah, the fact that everybody is so that, I mean, it's diet culture in its newest and latest incarnation, which is orthorexia, clean eating, whole 30, whatever you want to call yeah. it, right? It's it's diet culture in this guise of health. And that's that's how it's being packaged and sold to us. And that guise of diet culture is making people so explicit and so like over sherry about their food, right? There's this whole movement of people like sharing everything they eat on Instagram or on Facebook or whatever and chronicling in detail the foods that they make, what they ate in a day. People are trying to emulate it and people are holding it up for judgment and scrutiny. And it's like, it's taking this thing that is so intimate and personal and that we all know innately how to do. I mean, intuitive eating is the default mode, I like to say. Like, that's how we're born Mm -hmm. eating, right? That's how we're born relating to food. It's through diet culture that we lose it, that we kind of lose our way, but it's still in there. It's still within us to be able to eat like that. And I think that there is something really profound and powerful in coming back to that sense of like intimacy and inner wisdom and being like, I got this and no Mm -hmm. one else can say anything that's going to change what I'm feeling. You know, like this is, this is my truth. Yeah. And I mean, I'm totally, you know, I post pictures and stuff of meals and I, 99.9% of the time it's because like, I'm proud of it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, I'm enjoying this. And there's always some, you know, like, I try to always share, and it goes. And it, it does go back to, to to when I was younger with food. Like that, there's a context mm-hmm. around my relationship with with food, and I think that's great too. Like to sort of show people, like you can enjoy food and you you can take pleasure in food. Yeah. I think that's like a political act as well. Yeah, there's a limit. You know, um, I, like I said, I, I grew up in an Irish Italian and the Irish side of my family was, was very strong. My dad's directly from Ireland and I made um, Irish brown bread from scratch a couple of weeks ago. And, and it just, the process of making this food item, it, it reminded me of when I learned how to, how to bake it in Ireland. When I, when I was fortunate enough to, I, my, my family would you know, kind of send me off for the summers and I would pop around with, with my relatives. And there was this one woman who, who taught me how to make the brown bread. And, you know, as I was like, folding it together and mixing it all together, I couldn't help but but just appreciate that like this woman taught me, my grandmother, my aunt, the women predominantly of course, you know, this goes back and this is more than just a piece of bread, right? This is a living connection to people that provided, to people that cared for their family. And I and I knew that's just me. Like I think that when we look at food in such a a numbers and just like the macro the, the macros are people falling mm, out. Yeah. When you take the soul out of it, then it's almost removing the human factor. And for some people, I understand that that's just how they're, they've got to do it. I understand that. And then, but for me, when I tried that, it made it so less exciting to me and they made it so inhuman when really the story of food in my life is, the story of creation, the story of sharing, the story of of realizing and noticing and respecting and trial and error that it's so much bigger than the than the ingredients and the chemical and biological breakdown of it. 
So I try to have a story and I try to have those, you know, roast that chicken, have that thing that just you get really proud about, <laughs> whatever mm-hmm. that is in your life. Because uh, like I said, how you do one thing is how you do everything. So if you can, you can find, if you can find love in, in a bowl of brown flour and some buttermilk, <laughs> then you can find love anywhere. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, that's beautiful. And yeah, so true, right? Like food has such a soul and such meaning. And there are culinary cultures around the world in different forms that evolved independently, right? Like people have been connecting over food for millennia in various ways, shapes, Mm -hmm. and forms and feasts and holy days involving food like are, are so universal. So it's, I think to sort of break it down, like again, in this sort of modern incarnation of diet culture, it's like breaking things down to macros, which ew, like (laughs) just that's, yeah. People sometimes will ask me like, can I count macros and do intuitive eating? And I say, no, that's not, that's completely antithetical because intuitive eating is about not breaking food down to those components like that. You know, it's about Mm -hmm. taking pleasure in food and, you know, maybe considering, yes, like what is this food going to do for me energetically? Like what, you know, how much do I want to be satisfied in order to like do what I need to do today or whatever. But like also your body tells you that, you know, you can make a guess about what to serve yourself, but your body's going to tell you like, when it's had enough, what it enjoys, what is satisfying, learning to tune in and listen to that is the work of intuitive eating. Like that's the hardest thing in diet culture is to start to tune into that. But I think when you do, you can really discover like this richness around food that I think we all have the potential to have. And and so many of us have had in little ways throughout our past that maybe we didn't even recognize, you know, like connecting over a certain kind of food with family when we're young or the grandmother who teaches you how to make the thing or going to a restaurant like in a particular place that you traveled to and you know the amazing pie that you had there or whatever there's all these these moments and these memories and experiences around food that are really valuable and important to us like i have I've worked with clients with eating disorders who will say in their eating disorder, they'll be like really frustrated. Like, why does everything have to revolve around food? Why do, you know, all social situations have to be going out to dinner or going to get drinks or whatever? Mm. And they can recognize, or I will point out usually that that's coming from a place of like wanting to restrict and sort of being mad at the thing that's getting in the way of the restriction. But the truth is like we connect over food because that's human, because that's what we do. We've always done that. Throughout history, we've we've connected over food. It just so happens that now it's like, hey, do you want to meet at that bar for like drinks and bar food? But that was happening a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, like around a fire or with gathering things from the wild or whatever. Like it's always happened. And so we can't really deny the human instinct to connect over food. And I think that's a really important thing that like leaving diet culture can give back to us is that ability to do that. Absolutely. It's even hard for me to remember how I felt when I was so methodical with my food. That sort of sense of like of choice, but choice based with like heavy shoulders. You know what I mean? It's not like, Ooh, do I get to pick between these two things? It's like, Oh, I have to pick between these. No, <laughs> there's like this gravity to it. Mm-hmm. So I think I think about food equally. It's just the intention behind it is totally different. One comes from a place of now it comes from a place of of excitement, of of creativity. Like I said, like I look forward to those things. Or in the past, it was very calculating. It was giving me anxiety. It was sort of this chess game that the right conditions had to be met and. It's just a lot of pressure to have to maintain. And I think that I didn't even appreciate what I was consuming and what I was eating because it, that wasn't the that wasn't the focal point. The focal point was how much can I get away with to lose weight? How much can I eat out of this? And it's sort of very Western approach to things, sort of like eking out the potential and the profit and the, you know, the efficiency of things. It's like my body is not 
a huge multi corporation that needs to have, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. I want one piece of pizza, let's get a piece of pizza <laughs> or whatever, you know? Yeah. So it is, it's, it's complex. And, you know, and sometimes I feel like uh, maybe your other guests on here as I was scrolling through it's like oh wow I, I I know so many of the of the folks that have been on here in the past and you know I always wonder like when they hear other people lament about food and their bodies and, and all those things like and they maybe have a different approach you know what is it that do they talk about it with them do they engage with them is it and I always think about that you know like right now so many people in my life everyone knows about more love in my work and yet sometimes people make those comments about like, oh, I shouldn't be eating this or I really shouldn't be eating that. And mm-hmm. I, for me, it's almost like this, what I'm doing with myself, like my, my role right now is to, is to serve the people that get and want the work, right? Like I can't, I can't be the police. I can't be, I can't be doing what I, what I said I hated, right? I can't be policing people. Not everyone would agree with me on that, but I personally don't take that because it's it's really, first of all, not a business. I don't know where anyone else is on their journey or in their life. You know, who knows what everyone's dealing with. So I, it always been, like, like I'm saying, it, it comes back to me. It comes back to how does this conversation and what that person just said reflect back onto me? Did it trigger something with me? Did it make me feel like, oh God, they're judging me? You know what I mean? It, it comes so much more back to my own self. And what am I going to do with my life? So that's sort of what I just, I really do think about that. Like how are other people navigating that question since a lot of folks are on this side of the, the fence that we're talking about here and what's our, what's our responsibility? You know what I mean? I just think about that. That may be just the, the helper in me. <laughs> no, same here. I mean, also as a helper, I definitely think about these things a lot, but I think, you know, as a, like I'm a helping professional in my one part of my work life. And then I'm also a public speaker and podcaster in another part of my work life. And those two things sometimes are very different. Like it's very different approach that I have to take in doing this podcast and talking about diet culture and getting really angry about it and, you know, or just voicing that like on other people's behalf almost and allowing my guests to tell their stories that bring out the fire against diet culture. But then also there's that more intimate sort of like space, you know, the one-on-one kind of work with people, you can't be fiery like that unless that serves them. You know, it's like, is that, Mm -hmm. does anger serve this person at this point in their journey right now? Sometimes, yes, absolutely. Because at a certain point, I think people really do need to get upset when they see all the ways that diet culture is manifesting around them and be like, oh, it's that, it's not me, so that they can not turn the anger in on themselves, which is what diet culture has encouraged people to do all along, right? It's like, oh, the diet didn't fail. You failed. You're the failure. You know, get mad at yourself and try harder next time. Mm -hmm. And like for people to kind of wake up and say like, that's bullshit. Like I've been sold a lie and have like a justifiable anger towards it is great and a huge aspect of healing for so many people. But also like, a lot of people, it takes a very long time to get to that point. Some people never have like a super fiery moment, but they're just like, eh, I'm over it. Everybody's journey is different. So like, yeah, working with people in that sort of space that's much more intimate and much more just kind of having to be with someone wherever they're at on their journey is different from this like public speaking platform that I have and also different than my personal life, you know, because of course I have like friends and family who are dieting like anyone else in this culture. And I have to, you know, recognize that not everybody wants to hear me say like, I don't think your low carb diet's a good idea, you know, like maybe with certain people who I feel like I could have that sort of conversation with because I've connected with them around this stuff in other ways or just can like sense that they're at a point where they're ready to hear that, then maybe that is helpful. And I do sometimes do that. But also there are tons of other people that I'm just sort of like, I'm not going to go there right now because I don't either. I don't feel like I'm in the place to do that right now. I just want to not be at work (laughs) or I don't feel like they're ready to hear that. And I need to respect their journey too. But it is a dance. And that's Mm -hmm. something that comes up all the time, like in our Facebook group and my online course that I do, like people sort of wrestling with this idea of like, how do I 
speak out about diet culture and, you know, what's my place in influencing other people in my life. And like, I don't think anybody has it entirely figured out. You know, I think it's a practice too. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and, you know, the way that I ended up creating mortal love and, and, and doing this work, it wasn't because I wanted to teach anybody anything. It was because I was learning this for myself and sharing it. Yeah. First it was a blog. And the more that I, I talked about these things and not in the, and I was always been very, very open about the unresolution of a lot of things, that this is sort of a murky, you're never going to have that rainbow moment <laughs> that just sticks forever. And I got, I own that. And that, that's sort of where the term kind of comes from, more to love, that there's always a sense of movement. There's always a sense of growth and things that are unfolding for yourself, maybe physically and how you eat, but also who you're realizing and who you're becoming. That for me has always been a great entry point because to be honest, I still need this. I need this work in my life. I crave this work in my life because I have still the defaults of how I would think from years ago, but I know that there's always something beneficial to learning from it. So being able to teach that and to teach these approaches to people and really opening up the door, asking the right questions and creating a, creating a physical space an opportunity for them to like, just think about defaults and how they are with themselves and what does it mean to be more to love with, with their life and how they've been talking to their bodies and how they've been expressing their bodies in the world. You know, for some people, they'll never get there and that's fine. You know what I mean? Like there are some people that will forever be in the sort of, I call it the denial stage of, that there's no way that without diet, some kind of restrictive culture that, that that I can exist. And I understand a lot of people, I would say a majority of people stay in there. And then some people sort of dance and like leap into the peripherals of body acceptance where it's just almost like a free for all, right? Mm -hmm. It's sort of this like, it's very empowering. It's this gust. And I went through it. I was, you know, wearing all these things and I was doing all these, it was just like, here I am. And this is me now. And that's really, really empowering. And and I think a lot of folks that, that maybe f start following, at least in the plus size world, you know, plus size fashion, certain people, like they're in that mode that they kind of are like, screw this. I want to feel this way. And then eventually that, even that can sort of peter out where the, the stuff of your life comes back up, the unresolvedness of things. And so the person that I really work with the most is, is someone that is really thinking about the, the, I call the true act of body acceptance, the thing that's going to take them for the remainder of their days, the process rather than the place. How this like never ending awareness that you have with the, with your body, with your thoughts, with your emotions, with who you're becoming, who you were, that this is to, to learn how to navigate that rather than sticking and defining what you, who you are, what you stand for. And a lot of that comes with having to recognize that, that there are seasons, there are, there are things in your life that you're learning and then to move beyond them. So it's this way of how you are with yourself. And not a place that is, it's, but it's also sometimes the hardest thing to translate, right? People want those definitive, people are, we're logical. People, we want, you know, what am I going to get? What am I, what's going to happen? But this, this sort of for the rest of the world type of thing, to let go of the there, like I said earlier on, to let go of the time frame, to let go of even what does body acceptance look like? What does that even look like? And I'm someone who's been, been you know, considered a, certainly an expert here in, in Boston area, I would have a hard time even saying that I could, I could sum, sum up crystal clear of what body acceptance meant or what body positivity meant, even intuitiveness meant. And that's sort of my point is that there are obviously things that aren't those things, but you know, my body acceptance is going to look different from yours. It's going to look different from, you know, your, your colleagues. It's sort of like helping people that, that click with what, perspective that you offer, right? Instead of having, again, the, the, the definitive way. And I do get, I have to say, I do get very a little antsy when I sort of see those conversations happen, especially in the body positive community, that there is this like strict dogmatic approach to things. Because for me, I automatically just think of, of how I, that's how what I would have used to thought like 15 years ago. Mm, with diet culture. Yes. There, there's like a rule book and you're either in the book or playing by the book or you're not. And I just, I just can't, I can't let myself do that because I'm not interested in it. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's so important. I think to, to sort of yeah. have that discussion too, because 
there's this sense of like, yeah, wanting to translate maybe the same thinking of diet culture to this new body positive approach, right? And like do it Mm -hmm. the same way or play by the same rules. And it can be very destabilizing to realize like there really are no rules. It's much more individual and it's kind of your own journey is going to look different than everybody else's. And that's the point, Mm -hmm. right? And that we, I mean, when you were talking about embracing change and seasons and stuff, I was just thinking about like the fact that we all are changing constantly throughout our lives, right? Our molecules literally are like bouncing around and somehow stay together in a shape that looks like us, but actually it's this connection of molecules that's literally just like bouncing around the room and (laughs) Like, what is mm-hmm. this? You know, what this, there's like the, I don't know, the intersection of mystery and science is really, really lights my fire. So I always think about it in terms of this sort of weird quantum physics stuff. It's like, w- like, what even are we, you know, and th- these efforts yeah. to control our bodies, like, what are we even controlling here? What are we trying to like marshal into submission? Because it's changing every second without our awareness or effort anyway. And it's always Mm going to be changing and we're aging and we're all, you know, I'm older now than when we started this podcast. (laughs) Like it's just, this is life. Life is about change and is about learning how to accept and navigate that sort of seasonality and these comings and goings of other people in our lives, right? Like birth and death around us and our own seasons of life, our own aging process. And the fact that we all will get sick no matter what we do, no matter how quote unquote clean your diet is. And actually probably the more effort you make to have a clean diet, the more likely you are to get sick in certain ways. But like no matter what you do, food-wise or movement-wise or whatever, like curating your environment to be as like non-toxic as possible or whatever, like there's still going to be things that happen to you. There's still going to be ways that your body breaks down that you just have no control over. It's super morbid and upsetting to think about it if you if you go too far with it. But I think just having that awareness, like this is what we all go through. This is part of life can kind of help to to put it in perspective, you know, to help you realize like, okay, what am I doing trying to control my body and do it perfectly because my body is not one thing to control that is immutable and never changing. It's changing constantly. And then also maybe taking some of that spirit into how you approach body positivity or body acceptance. Like, okay, it's kind of this messy thing that's always changing and evolving. And maybe I'm like in one place, you know, I have this intention to like accept my body more, but I'm going to be in one place with it today and I'm going to be in a totally different place with it a year from now and, you know, all around the map in that the space in between. And it's only really looking back Maybe, you know, I look back 10 or 15 years ago and I can see tremendous change in how I relate to my body. But in that span of 10 or 15 years, I couldn't tell you the exact moment when it switched over because there wasn't one, you know, it just was like this incremental process. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think yoga and the sort of practice of that is so important to learning how to accept that change and that ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, a lot of things come back to intention. What is the reason and the energy behind something? And that changes. That changes, you know, what motivates you or, or pushes you one day can change you and in, in the other day. So it's it's more about like being able to identify and, and connect to that level of intention because then that to me is how things align. That that to me shows me that, you know, the choices that I'm that I'm taking in the world with my, with myself, with my body, whatever I'm doing, it's, it's being done with thought. It's being done with, with something that I'm, I'm able to identify and I'm able to get behind and be confident with. And I feel like when, when people do that, the judgment from other people and the fear around other people, people doing it a different way, it seems to be diminishing. It's like this connection to action and thought and that, that to me seems to be sort of the magic, the sweet spot of things. And, you know, even how you feel in your body changes. You know, I I deal with some physical things and a lot of the people that I work with deal with the physical things. And just even recognizing that in and of itself, that the body, the physical body 
you can want to do X, Y, Z, but if you're physically, your body is physically telling you, please, please know, like that's going to be, there's a big struggle there. I take the perspective that your body never lies, which is a really, I would never have thought that, you know, 10, 15 years ago that I would ever be looking to my body to tell me more information where in the past I would be believing that my body was like the fraud to kind of come to that other side of things and to have found something really that is working for me. It feels good because now it's like, okay, well, as I grow older, as I evolve and change and as, as things, you know, have happened, I may not know what will happen, but I, I will, I will know that I have a template of how to relate to those changes. You know what I mean? Like, and so it been, it doesn't make me as scared as, as it used to. I don't feel as fearful around those changes because I'm anticipating and I accept that change happens that I like how I, I like how I treat myself. <laughs> I like how I listen to myself. I like that I care. I like that I care. <laughs> it's really all, what all of this is about. Just, I like that I care and I can help other people, you know, care in the way that makes them feel like that. Then that's a good thing. However, that caring is, however that manifests, whatever that, whatever makes a person feel like they're happy that they roasted that chicken or whatever. That to me, I think is what makes people happy in life feeling like all their pieces are pieces are, are together and, and are, are moving along in some direction together. Totally. And I think that's what diet culture sort of taps into as well, right? Like I think it's mm-hmm. so diet culture can be so attractive in some ways because it tells you like, just do this and all your problems will be solved, you know? And, and it sort of yeah. preys upon that impulse. Promise. Mm-hmm. The promise. Because I mean, it's true. No one, no one wants to feel bad. Nobody wants to feel, nobody does. And I, and I honor that. I don't. No, me neither. No one wants to feel like that. And so I think that when there's a sense of the, that the external promises to take away the bad, then that's why people latch on to things. But the process of then shifting that inward, you're going to feel <laughs> icky and bad for a bit. You know what I mean? Like, and, and it is totally, it's like looking under the covers of the bed. You, mm-hmm. you, you're scared to do it. But for me, it's it's by far one of the most rewarding things. And, and it is totally connected with food. It is totally connected with how you are with yourself, with movement, with sleep, with it's just, yeah, it just kind of like that, you know, that, that what's that, like a snail shell that keeps, was it one of the things in geometry where it's like kind of like those universal things that all patterns and, and like life has that sort of integral circular thing. And it's so true, right? With like our own lives, it's just this evolving kind of all the same stuff comes up, maybe in just different situations, (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, like love, belonging, uh, safety, security. It's like, we're all dealing with these same core things, just in different situations and different circumstances and, and different things, bringing them up to the surface. So we're all continuously learning the same things just in different varieties. Absolutely. It's an awfully deep, deep philosophical conversation to talk about for food. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I think though. This is how I think all the time. This is exactly how I think all the time too. It's it's yeah, fantastic. This is where my husband in the middle of the night will be like, we shall just go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> just please go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Like, <I> can't. <laughs> oh my God, totally. I can't. <laughs> That's the actually speaking of, it's funny how, you know, these things come up in different ways in our lives, right? Like I've been having trouble sleeping lately and I've been having, I have acid reflux that comes and goes with stress, but it's been really bad lately. And, you know, through a lot of diety and eating disorder, trial and error, the eating disorder is what initially brought it on. And I'm confident that it has nothing to do with food, really. It's about stress, you know, it's about the stress Mm -hmm. I'm putting on my body and also coffee and maybe some high acid foods, but really it's, it's about, yeah. you know, it's like, there's certain things where I know that it's exacerbating it. Right. But I also, I also just need to like, stop going so fast and hard in my life, you know, in terms of work, really, mm-hmm. it's not like I'm out partying till 2am, but I am working till 2am sometimes. But I do feel like we are drawn to things that kind of give us what we need to give us what we need to work on or like allow us to explore something for ourselves. And what's really coming up for me these days with the podcast is like this sort of need for external measures of success, you know, and how Mm. that was like, 
I thought that that wasn't important to me because at a certain point in my media career, I decided like, cause I, you know, was a journalist before I became a dietitian. And I realized at a certain point, like if anyone talked to me about like awards or number of readers or comments or people's feedback on a story I had written, it totally threw me off my game. And I needed to not take that in. I needed to just put my head down and write and do the best I could. And like that seemed to work for me. And so I had tried to apply that to the podcast, but somewhere along the way, like getting positive feedback and seeing it rise in the rankings and seeing the download numbers kind of got to me like it does to so many podcasters. You know, people get really obsessed mm-hmm. with their downloads and that's super normal. So I'm not, you know, weird for feeling that way. But I, I have realized that lately, like I'm starting to veer in that direction of like external measures being too important to me, I think, you know, for my own sort of sanity. (laughs) Like, I think I need to shut that window a little bit and just refocus on why I do this, which honestly, this conversation has really helped me do like feeling so in the moment and vulnerable with people and talking about these issues that we all face. Like, that's what's important about this. That's what I love about this. And it's so nice to reconnect with that. Yeah, no, I completely relate with that. And, you know, as you were, as you were sharing it, it kind of comes back to what I was saying earlier on how like there's different seasons and phases, right? And so maybe for you, it's sort of like, how are you transitioning into, this is a hard thing for me because Mortal Love started off first as like me writing. And then to translate it into a business was like, is like tricky because then I had, then I had to learn all the business stuff and, and how to measure profits and and all of these things. So it, I completely understand how you how you feel like the thing that you created which was so personal and healing has now maybe served the, like the the purpose for you individually but now there's this community that that looks to it that values it. How do you then shift to also honor that? And you know the numbers and and all that stuff. And I have personally found like I I went through business courses to just, like make that like how do I put on my CEO hat? How do I do all that stuff? And if you ever wanted to have a conversation just about that, like I would totally love to. Oh yes, <laughs> I love this idea of like hustle and heart, like that like really blurred line about people that do things that are inspired by their own like process, but then it goes into a different realm. Like I don't I mean a lot, you only you only kind of see like people that have already done it like the big people, you don't really get the, the, the Mm in-betweens. It's like how you think about yourself as, as a business owner and when do the numbers matter? When do they not? It's confusing. It it almost feels, it's very similar to like dieting. It's very similar Mm -hmm. to body acceptance. It's, you're still creating something. Um, you're moving through something. So I completely, you're not alone in this at all. Thank you. (laughs) That is so fascinating. That idea of like, when does the external matter? Because that's the same with, yeah, eating and food too, right? Like intuitive eating Mm -hmm. is not just internal. Like there is some, you you live in a world, you live in an external environment. So you have to sort of make choices based on what's available and what's, you know, the external information you're being presented, like menus or, you know, what's in your fridge or whatever. So there's, there's an integration of the internal and the external, right? It's not like you just can live solely in the internal space. And that's the same totally with a business. It's like, there is that reality of like, I have to be making money to justify or sustain this or something, you know, I have to like Mm -hmm. pay my rent. I got to eat, right? (laughs) Like, you know, everybody's got to eat. But yeah, what is the sort of line? And that it is a very blurry line of like, what's helping to pay attention to and what's just overwhelming you or making you overthink things. Mm Mm-hmm. No, I hear you. That was also, I think, when I thought about it, what prompted my grazing last night. Mm. My like sort of, because I was all over the map with like, maybe I'll start refreshing my, my e-course. Or maybe I'll send this. Like I, I was mentally grazing <laughs> <laughs> and that then, and then like, it just was viscerally coming and I was able to catch it really fast. It, you know, that, that's sort of like the perk of all this. It's like, I can't not notice it really fast and I'll kind of continue to just ignore things and you're like, you know, you're doing that. Right. But again, yeah, it's that like compulsion, at least for me is like measuring up. That's why we, even when you email me, I was like, how me? Like, I'm not 
I'm not Bergy. I'm not, you know, all these things. <laughs> and so again, like we're our own bullshit. <laughs> totally. Oh my God. It is so, it's amazing. I'm so glad we're, we're talking about this. Cause I think this is yeah such important and stuff. And no one ever talks about it. No. no one ever talks about it because so much of entrepreneurship is dominated by men and you know, the men and like to talk about this, you just don't. And then I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs, like it's like a weakness to, to show that there's a lot of hard spots. Right. Yeah. Th- Cause it's dominate. Even the women in this space are sort of like conditioned in this very male centric entrepreneurial thinking where it's like, let me show you my income and tell you how I got there. You know, like this very, yeah, it's like, Ugh. That's, yeah, that's the same actually as like I weigh, you know, X, Y, Z and I lost right. you know, these many pants. It's like, totally. very, that's actually a really good point. You know? oh, hmm. It's so fascinating how the parallels with diet culture and entrepreneurship and how to do both. I mean, I did a little mini series on the podcast a while ago about like how to be like a health professional and not sell weight loss. But like, mm-hmm. there's this sort of larger question of like how to be a body positive and or just like heart based business owner of some kind, you know, a coach or a yoga teacher or whatever it is, and not fall into this like diet mentality trap with your yeah. own relationship with your work. Yeah. I really think, I really do believe that it comes to like knowing what you need to the client, to the customer, to the clients. Like they, they, they need X part of me. What I, you know what I mean? Like, and meeting people, like talking to like, this conversation, I didn't realize how much I needed to hear you say those things. So like, say like, well, I'm not alone in this. And, and to, to like seek that out, you know what I mean? Like, so that we can be exactly what our target market needs and like the marketing and the branding. And cause sometimes even if I start talking like this to my friends and they see more to love, they think that I'm like, like this corporation and like <laughs> Madison Avenue, like scam. I'm like, well, okay, well, I'm not, you know what I mean? So it's like, you also got to talk to people that like get it, you mm-hmm. know, that understand that there is, a, it's, it's heart centered, of course, but it's still a business. Right. It's our livelihood. It's it's what we're putting our name and like essence into the world for, for a reason, you know. Well, thank you so much for, for inviting me for anything here. If you need any, you know, additional stuff, please let me know. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Tell us real quick where the listeners can find you and learn more about your work. Well, this has been awesome to talk with you. And for anyone that would like to learn more and follow me and my work with More to Love, you can head to more to love with Rachel.com. Also have a Facebook page. You can just type in more to love with Rachel and that'll come up. And also on Instagram at Rachel Estapa. And I post a lot of us doing yoga, more to lovelies, just really trying to profile that there are people with all different types of bodies that are just taking the time to care about what matters to them and also the community around body positivity, especially here in the Boston area. And if you're ever in the Boston area, please look me up. Please come to a yoga class. We would love to welcome you. Yes, I will be doing that for sure next time I'm in Boston. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show. It was delightful talking with you. Thank you so much for having me. So that's our show. Thanks again so much to our guests for being here and to you guys for listening. And we'll be back again next week with another brand new episode. Meanwhile, I'd love to stay in touch. And the best way to do that is via email. So you can go to christyharrison.com slash email to sign up for my VIP list. I'll send you info about new episodes of the podcast as they drop, as well as exclusive sneak previews of new episodes, giveaways and other special deals on the products and services I offer, special tips on how to make peace with food and learn to trust your body and a whole lot more sign up at christyharrison.com slash email you can also subscribe via itunes and leave us a nice rating and review which is a great way to get the word out about the podcast and help other people find these important messages just go to itunes from your computer or your podcast app type in food psych to the search bar click on the result that comes up under podcasts and then click on ratings and reviews and you can leave a rating and review right there. And I really appreciate all the five-star reviews and wonderful ratings that we've gotten because it's helped us climb really high right now in the rankings. And that's really cool because we're competing against some of the weight management and body shaming types of messages that I'm trying to fight with this podcast. So we've really started to beat out a lot of the diety voices and I'd love to continue climbing higher in the rankings to get this message out even further. So please leave us a nice rating and review. It's so very much appreciated. And thanks to everyone who's left reviews so far. 
The music you're hearing behind me now is by a band called AWOL, and the track is called Food, used under the Creative Commons license. Thanks so much for listening, and until next time, stay psyched. Stupid or scared, no work in the kitchen now. Who put you there in that perfect position now? Who just wants your food, and you ain't really beat. Have you ever went?